Good evening. December 11th may go down as the day of the biggest robbery in our country's history, and it happened right here in New York. In 1978, what went down as the biggest heist in U.S. history happened at John F. Kennedy International Airport in New York. Half a dozen armed robbers in ski masks raided the Lufthansa Airlines cargo building and walked out with $5 million cash on one hand and 30 shipments of gold, pearls, jewelry, checks, and other assorted items on the other. In today's money, this figure amounts to about $27.6 million. The operation was as clean as a whistle. The masked men knew exactly how to infiltrate the building and where precisely to look. In fact, everything seemed so patterned out that investigators couldn't help but believe it was an inside job. Was it a coincidence that $5 million had just been flown into the airport from Frankfurt for delivery later that day to the Chase Manhattan Bank? Did they really have eyes inside the airport? That's what we're going to find out in this video. Join us as we look into one of the greatest heists in American history. While the robbers seem to know the ins and outs of the building's structure and security all too well, what was even more mysterious was the fact that the perps behind the robbery didn't face justice till almost three decades later. The FBI had been trying to crack the case since it happened, but many of those connected to the so-called Lufthansa heist ended up dead one by one. In 1980, the FBI investigators who were working on the case told the New York Times that it was the case that just won't die. Investigators believe James Jimmy the Gent Burke, an associate of the Luckey's crime family, was the mastermind behind the plot. James Burke, popularly known as Jimmy the Gent, was known to be a strategic thinker, and this was instrumental in orchestrating the largest heist of his time in 1978 with a love for violence and crime. Unarguably inspired by his background of abuse and domestic violence, he found a niche in which he particularly prevailed. Jimmy the Gent, a nickname he got because he treated people who cooperated with him well, especially in the form of financial rewards, was very notorious for hijacking supplies from John F. Kennedy. He was also known to be a very brutal gangster, especially in the form of torture and murders. Most of his murder victims were either never found or found with dismembered bodies, which were usually chopped to pieces. A popular story shared about him was when he repaid an elderly woman her son's debt of $5,000 and then went ahead to chop the boy in pieces, his body scattered all over his car. He was also a well-known strategist, and despite being absent from the crime scene, he masterminded the operation that ended up cashing about $5 million in cash and $875,000 worth of valuables from the JFK Airport's Lufthansa Airlines cargo terminal in what would later be known as the Lufthansa heist. This was not his first criminal accomplishment as James Burke was known to be hugely motivated to commit crimes as long as there was a significant financial reward. Before this heist, James had been arrested a couple of times, and in 1972, he was even convicted and sentenced to 10 years in jail for extortion after beating Gaspar Schiacco up for owing a gambling debt to their boss, Casey Rosado. On his release after six years, Burke promptly resumed his activities and devised a plan for this heist. Most of the planning of any hijacking that took place at JFK Airport at the time happened at Robert's Lounge, and that of the famous Lufthansa heist wasn't any different. Robert's Lounge was a famous place in the underworld, but also for law enforcement. It was owned by Jimmy Burke, and it served as his headquarters for several years. The building was a clubhouse, a drinking bar, and also a restaurant. It served as a hangout for Burke and his associates, and it was very close to JFK Airport. The close proximity of Robert's Lounge to JFK Airport meant that a good number of the airport staff would frequent the place. This proximity would later help in staging one of the biggest heists in the history of the U.S. After getting in touch with his friend Henry Hill, the concept came to life. Hill had gotten information that Lufthansa, a popular airline, flew in currency to its cargo terminal at John F. Kennedy International Airport, and that from there, lots of untraceable cash and valuable goods could be stolen. This information got to Martin Kugman from Lewis Werner, who had gambling debts to settle with him. 
Werner also had a history of related crimes, including stealing $22,000 from the same company in 1976. After a series of investigations that came to no end, the company retained him, and seeing the opportunity for a bigger payday, he planned the heist with Peter Grunwald. Although he didn't have the resources to pull off the heist, he let someone who lent him money, named Kugman, in on the plan after Kugman pressed him to settle the debt. Krugman reached out to Hill, who then told his longtime associate Burke, who proceeded to divulge the plans. On getting this information, James Burke fine-tuned the plans, tying up the loose ends that the inexperienced robbers left. He used his ties with the Lucky's crime family to get the armed robbers he needed, and he began to plot the execution of the heist. He planned to target the cargo building used by Lufthansa at the airport. The plan was to rob Lufthansa of the cash in their high-value storage area. This money came into the airport from Europe and was destined for U.S. banks. Usually, the money was held at Lufthansa for a few hours, but occasionally, if it came in after the Brinks trucks had left, it was held until the next business day. Because it was cash from American overseas exchanging currency, it was in small bills with non-sequential serial numbers. Jimmy knew that, with good inside information, this could be a great score. Two members of Jimmy's crew, Robert Frankie McMahon and Joe Buda Manriques, were sent to interview Werner. They were the only contacts from the crew that Lewis Werner would ever meet. The crew used information from Lewis Werner to work out the details of the heist. Information like the number of guards on duty, logistics, and the time when the cargo building is most vulnerable Burke had assembled his team for the heist ensuring that they all had valuable skill sets that measured up to the requirements of the heist. The team included Henry Hill and Thomas Desimone, who were his trusted associates, as well as Angelo Sape, Luis Cafora, Joe Manry, Paolo Lacastri, and Robert McMahon for the robbery, although it was not clear if Henry was at the scene of the robbery. Burke's son, Frank, was tasked with driving the backup vehicle, and Parnell Edwards was to dispose of the van after the operation. Each member of the team was promised between $10,000 and $50,000 depending on their roles, while Louis Werner was to receive 10% of the cut. With a foolproof plan in place, the team broke in around 3 a.m. on Monday, December 11, 1978, with a black econoling van carrying the six members of the robbery crew. They dressed up in all black dresses, wore gloves, and covered their faces with ski masks. They cut the padlock with bolt cutters and entered the building. They successfully disabled all the alarms and put out the light in the parking lot where their van was parked. Two unmasked members of the crew remained at the lot while the others entered the building. Once inside, they were expecting to meet 10 employees, and since it was their meal break, most of them were expected to be in the lunchroom. The first employee they met was John Murray, a senior cargo agent hostage, and he led them to the lunchroom, where they met five others. They put them in cuffs and ordered them to lie flat on the floor with their eyes closed while waving guns at their faces. Murray told them that two employees were missing, Rudy Erich, the night shift cargo traffic manager, and Carrie Whalen, the cargo transfer agent. Murray was further used to lure Erich to their midst before threatening him to cooperate with them. Whalen, on the other hand, was not in the building but was soon caught as he drove into the parking lot. He saw the unmasked men and approached them. He was pistol whipped and asked to lie down in the van. Rolf Redman, another warehouse worker, heard the commotion. And as he approached them, he was met with a gun pointed at his head and was asked to join Murray in the van. He was later escorted to the lunchroom and they later found the last security in the warehouse, accounting for the 10 employees they were expecting to find. While those in the building were fully armed in anticipation of resistance, there was hardly any resistance as Erich cooperated in helping break into the double door vault. This was not before his whole family was threatened though. They loaded the cash into 72 15 pound cartons and other valuables like jewelry and placed them into the van in the parking lot. The crash car driven by Burke's son came around just in time and while two of them were in the van with the stolen items, 
the rest left in the car to meet with Burke who was waiting for them at an auto repair shop close by. They got two cars, which they loaded up with the cartons and split up, instructing a member to destroy the van, which was also stolen earlier along with any evidence that was left in it. They instructed the employees not to call the authorities until 4.30 a.m., and they also complied. The whole operation was a success and was concluded in just a little over an hour. As genius as Burke's plan was, it all began to crack within days of the operation, and this was due to the pressure that the investigations of law enforcement were mounting upon all the parties involved. Despite the crew's reckless spending spree, the task of proving them guilty didn't prove to be an easy one. At the time, everybody knew that the robbery was Jimmy Burke and his crew's handiwork, but being able to prove that required substantial evidence. The law enforcement agencies needed forensic evidence like Jimmy Burke, Tommy Desimone, or Henry Hill's fingerprints. Another option was that they needed to recover some of the stolen money from one of their premises or someone to talk about the robbery. Unfortunately for the law enforcement agencies, they did not have any of these at the time. Burke, paranoid and scared due to his previous time in jail, began to spiral off and resolve to kill anyone who could implicate him or link him to the heist. The first issue was with Edward Stacks, who had been tasked with destroying the van. Edwards rather stupidly dumped the van in front of his girlfriend's house. Once the FBI discovered the truck, they recovered some evidence and linked the crime to James Burke. Within three days, Burke and his crew were the main suspects, and their phones, cars, and other devices were bugged. In a matter of days, they recorded a conversation where one of the crew members said something relating to the bag from Lufthansa and where the money was kept. All these, though, were not enough to get an arrest or search warrant, but Burke felt the heat. Seven days after the heist, Edwards was found dead on his bed with six bullets in his brain. Acting on Burke's orders, Desimone shot and killed him. This was just the first in a series of deaths in the aftermath of the heist. Martin Krugman was the next to go less than a month after the heist. Burke started to sense that Krugman had the possibility of snitching on them to the FBI, and this feeling was confirmed with the way Krugman was nervously and angrily asking for a $500,000 share of the heist. While it is well known that Burke killed him, his body was never found. Shortly after, Thomas Desimone, a member of the heist crew, was declared missing. However, it is rumored that his death was most likely unrelated to the heist, as he had angered the Gambino family. This was another big family of crime at the time, and that was the cause of his murder. Days later, Richard Eaton, a longtime associate of Burke, was also found dead with his body hogged and hanging in a meat freezer truck. This was because he tried to steal $250,000 out of Burke's cut of the heist and abscond with it, together with two other Burke associates, Montelion and Theresa Ferreira, who also died within the next two weeks. Ferreira's dismembered torso was found in a nearby river. Louis Cafora, who was Burke's cellmate in prison, was also killed for being rather stupid. First of all, he had a habit of discussing gang secrets with his wife, Jonna Kafora. Also, shortly after the heist, he drove the expensive custom pink Cadillac Fleetwood, which he bought with his cut of the heist, to a meeting just blocks away from the JFK airport while investigations were still on. He and his wife went missing the next March, and their bodies were never found. Also, Joe Budamanri, who had ambitions of becoming a made man in the Luckjee's crime family, and Robert McMahon were both found dead in a car, with gunshot wounds to the backs of their heads some months later. This came after the FBI contacted them and informed them that they would be convicted of other crimes they had been found guilty of except they informed against Burke on this case. These two were part of the team that plotted the heist, and while they declined the request, Burke felt that it was a matter of time before they bulge, so he silenced them forever. While the FBI had no doubts about who committed the murders, they found it hard to get incriminating and substantial evidence to present in court. About two months after serious investigations, about ten members of the Luckey's family were subpoenaed to appear in front of the court, 
and the link was drawn between the heist and the murder of Edwards by the now missing Tommy Desimone. Whalen positively identified one of his attackers as Seep when the police showed him police archive photos during an interview. Erich later reported that the robbers were well informed and knew all about the safety systems in the vault, including the double door system, whereby one door must be shut for the other one to be opened without activating the alarm. The robbers ordered Erich to open up the first door to a 10 by 20 foot room. They knew that if he opened the second door, he would activate an alarm to the Port Authority police unit at the airport. Angelo Sape was the first person to be arrested in connection with the case, based on the information received concerning his location during the robbery, as well as the descriptions of the employees who saw him unmasked. His bail was set at $1 million. The papers also mentioned that James Burke was a suspect in the robbery. About one month later, Charges of participating in the Lufthansa robbery were dropped against Angelo Sepp, but he was still held for violating the terms of his probation for consorting with another felon, which was James Burke. Oddly enough, on April 12, Burke would be arrested for violating the terms of his probation for consorting with a known felon, Angelo Sepp. The first breakthrough that the FBI would have was from Peter Grunwald, who had been grilled several times by the police due to suspicions over his and Lewis Werner's sudden financial fluidity, as all his debts had been paid and Werner had just bought a new customized van in cash. They claimed that they had had luck in gambling, but that luck was not on his side when he was summoned to appear before the grand jury investigating the robbery. Grunwald did not know that he was not allowed to leave the country, so when he and his wife flew out for a vacation, the FBI was contacted, and he was arrested. He was not granted bail, and after spending some time with the other prisoners in the jail, he confessed all he knew about the heist, Louis Werner's involvement, and even about the earlier $22,000 theft two years before the heist. This led to Werner's arrest on $1 million bail. A court date was fixed and Grimwald revealed in court that he and Werner had carried out the theft of the $22,000 and had planned a much bigger heist for later, but could not execute it. He also claimed that Werner had promised him $65,000 if the plan ever came to life and another $50,000 if he lost his job. Finally, he claimed that Werner had given him $50,000. Several other suspects, especially those involved in the $22,000 theft, testified against Werner, but none had enough incriminating information about the heist Werner, on the other hand, refused to expose James Burke and the rest of the crew, and at the end, he was found guilty of three of the six counts against him, which included helping to plan and carrying out the heist, as well as the theft two years earlier. He was sentenced to 15 years in prison, and a fine of $25,000. He was convicted in June, and there was no new information about the case for the next six months. At this time, Henry Hills, Burke's other trusted associate who was in the robbery, was facing a 25-year sentence in relation to a drug bust. At this point, Werner had decided to reveal more as he was not enjoying himself in jail. He decided to cut a deal with the government and gave them some information but it was not substantial as he did not directly meet Burke, and the only member of Burke's crew he met, Manry, was dead at the time. On the other hand, Hill felt that Burke wanted to kill him, and he was scared for his life and that of his family, leading to him offering information to the government in exchange for protection. He later joined the Witness Protection Program and gave indicting information on Burke's involvement in the case. Hill also cut a deal with the FBI regarding his sentence. Henry Hill was initially reluctant to reveal information that only a few people knew about so that Burke would not trace back the information to them. Also, the detective who was tasked with interrogating him claimed that Henry Hill had the mental capability of an eight-year-old, as he did not know how to keep records straight, often contradicting himself. After a while, with the FBI about to lose trust in him, he had to reveal what he knew. He told them all he knew about Burke, not only the heist, but also his ties with the Lucky's crime family and his other criminal activities. 
In April 1980, almost 18 months after the heist, Burke was taken into custody. As they could not tie any crime to Burke, they began to lose hope. But then Hill saved the day, rather accidentally, revealing that they used to fix basketball games. This was enough for the FBI, who were desperately trying to take Burke down on whatever account it was. In January 1982, 52-year-old Burke was handed a 20-year sentence and placed in a federal facility in Milan, Michigan. The FBI did not abandon Burke's case at this point, though, and in 1985, he was further found guilty of the murder of Richard Eaton, and his sentence was extended to a life imprisonment. This information was also from Hill's testimony. Juni the Gent, James Burke, died of cancer on 13 April 1996 in a Buffalo hospital where he was transferred to, from a prison in upstate New York. Juni Burke never confessed to being a part of the Lufthansa heist until his death. Upon his demise, one question still remained unanswered. Where did all the money go? Well, a lot of people got money from the proceeds of the heist, which will never be found. A major benefactor of the robbery was the Mafia. The bosses of the mob got in a large chunk of this money and were never linked to the heist until this day. Angelo Sib, who served 10 months for his parole violation, was found dead in a basement apartment in Brooklyn. He had been arrested earlier on a weapons charge and was awaiting trial. A week before his death, Sip had robbed a connected dealer, and when it was payback time, it came in the form of two mafia hoods with silencer-equipped pistols. Before he could ask the hoods not to harm his girlfriend, they fired three bullets into his head and also shot the open mouth of his sleeping 19-year-old girl. The final member of the crew, 26-year-old Frank James Burke, Burke's son, was also found shot to death on Liberty Avenue in the Cypress Hills section of Brooklyn at 2.30 a.m. on May 18, 1987. Two days later, police arrested a 46-year-old convicted drug dealer for the murder of young Burke. It was revealed that Frank Burke had become an associate of the Gambino family before his death. This was how the whole crew who orchestrated the robbery, except Henry Hill, who was reportedly absent from the crime scene after falling out with Sip, died within 10 years of the heist. Louis Werner also benefited from his cooperation with prosecutors and had his sentence reduced to five years. Upon his release, he and his girlfriend Janet Barbieri were given new identities and moved to another location outside of New York City for their safety. Louis Werner was the only person ever prosecuted for the Lufthansa theft, although he only got 10% of the proceeds. In addition, apart from the Richard Eaton murder, which is not even directly connected to the heist, no one was ever arrested in connection with any of the murders associated with it. Vincent Asaro, a capo in the Bonanno crime family, was arrested on January 23, nine years ago, in conjunction with an indictment charging him with involvement in the Lufthansa heist. His cousin, Gaspar Valenti, testified against him. The case against Asaro was based on an informant who was referred to by Asaro's attorney as one of the worst witnesses I have ever seen. On November 12, 2015, Asaro was acquitted of all charges connected to the heist by a jury in Brooklyn. It was a Hollywood ending for Asaro, who could have spent the rest of his life in prison if he was convicted of racketeering charges, which included allegations of murder, solicitation of murder, extortion, and robbery. Free. Asaro exclaimed with his hands thrust into the air as he left the federal courthouse in Brooklyn. The then 80-year-old ex-mobster was dying to get home. When asked what he planned to do once he got there, Asaro said, have a good meal and see my family. Asaro later died on October 22, 2023, at age 88. To this very moment, the bodies of Tommy Desimone, Martin Krugman, Luis Cafora, and his wife Joanna are still missing, as well as $5.8 million from the airport heist. And here we come to the end of our story. If you like it, don't forget to click the like button and share it with your friends. Thanks for watching.